Father, now that I wander with Thee, flowers and fields are alive with Thy joy. All that I own to Thee I've given, now I sing and Thy love I am free. Father, now that I dance in Thy name, birds and animals share in my song. All my sorrows, all my merriment, join in music to set hearts aflame. Father, now that I wander with Thee, flowers and fields are alive with Thy joy. All that I own to Thee I've given, now I sing in Thy love I am free. Father, now that I dance in thy name, birds and animals share in my song. All my sorrows, all my merriment, join in music to set hearts aflame. All my sorrows, all my merriment, join in music to set hearts aflame. Good morning, friends. Thank you for joining us for our Sunday service. We're broadcasting from Ananda Village and the Temple of Light. And we come together this way every Sunday now in one great global family. So please enjoy yourself this morning but also take these concepts and this great teaching deeply into your lives so that it can change you, change your consciousness. I'll read this week's reading from Rays of the One Light, which are weekly commentaries showing the similarity of the Bible and Bhagavad Gita based on Master's teachings. This week's topic is Truth Invites, It Never Commands. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. Free will is a basic principle of life. God never coerces. He invites us to live in such a way that we find fulfillment in ourselves. If we refuse to live rightly, Paramahansa Yogananda taught, God simply says, I will wait. We have eternity to live. In that eternity, we live as we choose, in self-created darkness, a darkness as intense and as long-lasting as we choose, or an infinite light, the true self, which is God. Jesus Christ in the Beatitudes offered a beautiful example of God's way of inviting mankind to seek perfection, not by commanding, but by offering his children the incentive that they need to choose the right of their own volition. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus said, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. In each of the Beatitudes, Jesus explains the blessing attendant upon observing it. The divine way, similarly for each of us, is not to do violence to our own nature. Spirituality must be attained naturally. It can never be attained by force. The Bhagavad Gita says in the third chapter, even the wise behave in accordance with nature 
as it is manifested in them. Of what avail then is suppression? The scripture then goes on, however, to explain that this doesn't mean we should surrender to the dictates of our lower nature. Rather, it emphasizes our need to aspire to the heights. But each of us, in accordance with his own nature, and not in imitation of anyone else's, offering ourselves up for purification by divine grace. Desire, whatever form it takes, so the Bhagavad Gita explains, should be resisted, even if only mentally. Attachment and repulsion to sense objects, both of these are universally rooted. No one should accept their influence, for verily they are man's enemies. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. <clears throat> oh. Good morning, everyone. I also want to welcome you to our Sunday service and thank you for joining us. Uh, it's just, we're so blessed to have these teachings and the guidance from Master and Swamiji to understand the deep meaning of the scriptures. So I'd like to begin with reading a Prayer Demand from Whispers from Eternity by Master that helps illustrate our topic for this week. This is, Tune us that we may hear thy voice. Volumes of thy savor voice resound through the loudspeaker of every loving heart. The voice of thy wisdom roams through the ether of space seeking everywhere hearts that are tuned to ecstasy. Sadly, thy warning sermons pass unheard by souls deafened with the static of sense pleasures. O divine broadcaster, tune our souls, long distracted by the static of our indifference. Fine tune us with the delicate touch of soul perception. Grant us the privilege of hearing thy magic melodies in the ecstasy of divine awakening. Master was a great poet. So this is actually a very, very important topic this week because in many ways it's the core of how we grow spiritually and it's the core of how to have harmonious relationships uh, in the world with others around us. So what is the core that we're talking about? First, it's that God does not demand. We have free will, God-given free will. And Master said somewhat humorously, maybe God regrets from time to time that he gave us free will because we can make such a, a mess of things. But nevertheless, he did. We are endowed, each individual is endowed with free will. And when we ask why, it's a beautiful answer because God wants us to love him from our own volition, from our own hearts yearning for him, not because it's imposed upon us. He wants us to make the right choices not because it's imposed upon us, but because we understand that by living in attunement with God and his consciousness, that we will find our own happiness. So we heard in the reading that God does not demand, he invites, he invites us to act in such a way that we will discover that action and thoughts, words, in attunement with divine consciousness, bring us us everything we're looking for. 
And as we heard in the affirmation, when we learn the lessons that life teaches us, we grow towards freedom and joy. And so it, there's a huge responsibility here, isn't there? That we need to understand we are the master of our fate. We created the karma that got us to this point in life, whether good or bad or indifferent. And we can create the karma that offsets bad karma and that builds the good karma that helps us to make the right choices of our own free will. It's a wonderful thought, wonderful, actually freeing thought. Because if it was all imposed on us, what would be the evolution of the soul? It's a, we can imagine that at the moment, you know, they talk about the big bang of creation. Well, let's talk about the big bang of God sending forth sparks of himself as individual souls. Go out into the world, just like in the little bird in the Festival of Light. See what you can make of this creation. See what you can come to understand. And then step by step, choose to come back to me. That's the whole game, isn't it? It's to go out, to understand where true happiness, true freedom lies, and work our way back. And then like the prodigal son, there's the grand rejoicing when the soul said, ah, I choose thy love, I choose only thee. And the Beatitudes are such beautiful examples of this, aren't they? They're so I, I must admit, I never appreciated them as much in, as I thought of them in the context of God inviting, not demanding. Because he's, he's just, he's not saying, you need to be meek, you need to be pure in heart. It's not a commandment. He's saying, blessed are the meek, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Many of you have heard us say this, but I just, I can't help but when I think of the Beatitudes, I think of the experience we had with them on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And we had gone to the Mount of Beatitudes with a group of pilgrims. And we were, it's at that time, it, it was very simple, just a garden and overlooking the Sea of Galilee. And there was a small open air chapel. And we went in there for our group went in and one of our members, Greg Sagmeister, I remember saying, uh, Swami sang the Beatitudes, and then we just came out and meditated. But as we tuned into the silence, we began to hear this kind of whispering, murmuring, and it, it kind of got, the more we tuned in, the more it became louder, and we realized there were pilgrimage groups from all over the world, and they were all repeating the Beatitude in their own native language. So there was Spanish and Italian and German and French and Russian and Chinese and on and on and on, and languages I'd never heard before. And they were all in their own way repeating the Beatitudes. And they all joined together. And it was like, oh, in this kind of murmur of divine yearning. And it was quite a powerful moment. But we need to understand that God is inviting us. He's saying, use your free will. This is, if you are merciful, you'll attain mercy. If you're pure at heart, you shall see God. And it's, it's not like the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. But it's, in, it's with deep respect for the individual free will and for the individual soul that they will find their way back to God. God knows we will. He knows, he, Divine Mother knows we will find our way back, but it has to be in our own way. And, it, and so it's this beautiful, it's, it's really like Divine Mother or Heavenly Father used, uh, sending the, their children off to school and knowing that I can't go to school for you. I can't learn the lessons you need to learn. I can't help you understand necessarily how to get along with the other children in your class. These are lessons you need to learn for yourself through your own free will, and this is how you will grow. And so we see this beautiful play of God never coercing, but inviting. 
there's a delightful story that uh, Master tells of one of, in, during his sojourn on earth, he had a disciple named Herb Jeffries, and he was a, um, a movie star and a singer in the big band era, and, and fairly well known and popular. And one can imagine he led a rather uh, Hollywood style life. And, but he, he was drawn to master in this path. And once they were, master was talking with him, and Herb Jeffrey said, you know, when I grew up and I went to church, I heard, all I heard was, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. I want to know, what shall I do? What can I do? And master chuckled. And then he said to him, knowing, knowing the man's tendencies, he said, Herb, do you enjoy smoking? And he said, well, I do. And Master said, and I think Herb was expecting him to say, you must stop smoking. He said, you may continue. He said, Herb, do you enjoy drinking alcohol and liquor? And kind of a little embarrassed, he said, well, sir, yes, I do. And expecting, you know, the shoot of drop. And he said, Master said, you may continue. And then he said, Herb, do you enjoy the company of beautiful women? And Herb said, kind of looking down at this boy, uh, yes, sir, I do. And Master, with a beaming smile, said, you may continue. But then the invitation. But I must tell you, if you begin practicing these teachings and practicing Kriya Yoga, your desire for all those things will fall away. And so it's the invitation, use your own free will. If you want to choose the path of Kriya Yoga, your life will improve. You won't be bound by those desires and habits and attachments that only pull your consciousness down. And so it's, it, it's such a lovely thought. And that's why we also read that Whispers from Eternity, because those about tuning in, those, those invitations are being sent to us all the time. If you do this, you'll be happier. Why not try it? And it's up to us to, you know, it's sort of like that game uh, you play as children where you hide uh, somebody, you hide something. One child goes out of the room and, and the rest of the children hide something. And then the child comes in and as they get nearer to the hidden objects, the other children say, hotter, 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 and if they go farther away from it, they say, colder, 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 and then finally, hotter, hotter, you're burning up, and then the child finds the hidden object. Well, it's like that, isn't it? It's this game. If we go in the direction of attachments and desires and uh, self-will, master is just saying, colder, 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 and if we get closer to good discipleship and uh, focusing our life in God, he'll say warmer, warmer, warmer. And so it's, it's really a lovely, lovely process. And it's the same, as I mentioned, with how we relate to people in the world. If you, and, and this is something really important for us all to remember. We can force our will on other people. We can judge them. We can say, if you do that, you're going to really, something bad's going to happen. Or we can invite them by our own example, by our own unconditional love, by, there is also a story of Master that one of the disciples was, I believe he was speaking against Master and doing things that were self-destructive and, uh, and the other disciples were angry and were judging him for speaking against their guru. And they told Master, this man is saying these things about you. Master listened and he said, I must give him a phone call. And they were all expecting he was going to really chew him out. And they were, some of them were there. Master called the man on the phone. This was the rotary dial error. That's why I'm going like that. And before the cell phone error. Um, and Master called up the man. And he simply said, I want to thank you for the wonderful spirit you show. And he just went on to praise him and support him and give him his love. And the other disciples were just shocked. And, and yet, from that moment on, that point on, the man began to change. Master invited him, invited him to live a better way of life through his love. 
And if he had come down the other way, the man could have gone underground with it, as it says in the Gita, of what avail is suppression. And, but it still would have been there. This way of his own free will, he could change. And so in your dealing with other people, if, if you see someone acting in a way that you think is wrong or is harmful to you or something you're involved with, try to remember it's really not very effective to try to force your will on other people. Oftentimes, I've made this mistake, Some will come, someone will come to us for counseling or advice, and, and there, one can see that the course they're following is gonna bring them a great deal of suffering. And yet, I've made the mistake of trying to give them, no, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that, and of what avail is suppression? They were already set on that course, and all it did was create a wedge between me and that other person. If, if I had been more neutral, they would have gone that way in any case. They would have maybe learned their lesson, and then they would have thought of me more as a neutral, supportive friend. And so that was a, in a lesson that I had to learn the hard way. But I want to share with you, if we can try in our way not to force our will on people from our limited understanding and uh, intuitive perspective. I just want to read a little story. I could tell you the story, but I love reading autobiography, and this is just a brief little encounter between Master and Sri Yukteswar. So let's just pretend like we're a little fly on the wall in, Master, in Sri Yukteswar's hermitage. And uh, this is chapter 13, The Sleepless Saint. It's after the beautiful chapter, Years in My Master's Hermitage. And Master says to his guru, Sri Yukteswar, after he'd been serving in the ashram and had many responsibilities there, Master says, please permit me to go to the Himalayas. I hope in unbroken solitude to achieve continuous divine communion. I actually once addressed these ungrateful words to my master. Seized by one of those unpredictable delusions which occasionally assail the devotee, I felt a growing impatience with hermitage duties and college studies. A feeble extenuating circumstance is that my proposal was made when I had been only six months with Sri Yukteswar. Not yet had I fully surveyed his towering statue. Then Sri Yukteswar replies, many hillmen live in the Himalayas, yet possess no God perception. My guru's answer came slowly and simply. Wisdom is better sought from a man of realization than from an inert mountain. Ignoring Master's plain hint that he, and not a hill, was my teacher, I repeated my plea. Sri Yukteswar vouchsafed no reply. I took his silence for consent, a precarious interpretation, readily accepted at one's convenience. And so here we, and I'll read a little bit more in the next chapter, here, it's exactly that situation, isn't it? The, and of course, Master wasn't in delusion, but he's playing it out for us. And he, so he's saying, I'm, I'm getting a little restless here, and I'm going to tell my guru I'm going to go away for a while. Shri Teshwar doesn't say, thou shalt not, thou must stay, you are out of tune. Because he knows that of what avail is suppression. He knew that Yogananda had this profound yearning to find God. And he had to let him do it in his own way. And also he had many lives as, Himalayan yogi, as a Himalayan yogi. And he knew that there was that draw. And so Master's gone and he visits the sleepless saint. And we, it's kind of a complicated, disappointing experience for him. And then he comes back to the hermitage. And I'll just read a little bit here. I am here, Guruji. My shamefacedness spoke more eloquent for me. Sri Yukteswar says, let us go to the kitchen and get something to eat. Sri Yukteswar's manner was as natural as if hours and not days had separated us. Master, I must have disappointed you by my abrupt departure from my duties here. I thought you might be angry with me. Of course not. Wrath springs only from thwarted desires. 
I do not expect anything from others, so their actions cannot be in opposition to my wishes. I would not use you for my own ends. I am happy in my own, only in your own true happiness. And what chapter is that that I just started reading? Chapter 14, An Experience in Cosmic Consciousness. So it was shortly after that that Sri Teshwar called Master down from the upstairs room where he was meditating and bestowed on him the experience of cosmic consciousness. But that drama had to be played out for us. It's very moving, really. The self-willed disciple saying, I want to do what I want to do. The guru saying, do what you must. Then when the, guru come, the disciple comes back, he, he invites him, come, let's go have something to eat. And then later bestows on him what he was seeking in the only way it could have come. So this weekend, we're also celebrating the spiritual anniversary of Swami Kriyanandaji meeting his guru 72 years ago and taking discipleship. And Swami was such a wonderful example of this. He so rarely, rarely imposed his will. In fact, he never imposed it. Sometimes he would suggest more strongly than others, but he never imposed it. In fact, he confided to a few people towards the end of his life. He said, you know, so much of what happened in building Ananda, I just had to compromise. I thought I knew what was the right way to go, but people weren't ready for it or they were resistant to it. And so I let them learn their own way. And, and what, what does that say? It's his principle, people are more important than things. Maybe Ananda could have physically, could have been much more glorious than it was, but Swami was interested in the growth of the individual, so he didn't impose his will on us. And in our lifetime for Jyotisha and me, our time with Swami, I think even though we were blessed to have many hours, many, many hours with him privately, we, I think in all those years, 45, 46 years, I think we only asked him three or four personal questions. And he was always very neutral. He, he rarely gave you a direct answer. He said, well, it could go either way. Maybe that would work, maybe that wouldn't work. But he, because he wanted us to make, to discover it within ourselves. And yet he was there. If we got too far off, we knew he was there. But once um, this person was wanting to start a new kind of business, and we were talking with Swamiji about it, and uh, it, we said, you know, we've tried this before. It doesn't work. And so I think we should tell the person not to do it. And Swami was very, very, that, this time he did, was more asserting his will. He said, maybe you know it won't work. Maybe I know it won't work, but that person doesn't yet know it. So we have to give them the chance to learn. And that was what he did over and over again, giving us the chance to exert our own free will and then little by little to learn our lessons. And Swami was so many examples of how when people disappointed him, when people, uh, there was, we've told this story, but there was a man some years ago who was in charge of the retreat programs. And right before our big annual spiritual renewal week, and this man was sort of a turbulent sort, but Swami supported him right before the big week of Spiritual Renewal Week, this man quit being the manager and really left the whole thing kind of in shambles. And we said, we went and told Swami, he said, you know, so-and-so quit, walked off the job and now nobody wants to work with him. And Swami looked real thoughtful and he said, okay, nobody wants to work with him, then I'll hire him on my staff. And he did. And the person did very, very well. Ultimately, he left. But in that time, there was a lot of growth. There was another young man who Swami gave, he was on Swami's staff, a different person, and Swami gave him a great deal of energy. I think he saw that this man was going to leave at some point, and he was trying to give him as much spiritual energy as he could. 
And finally the man came to Swami and he said, I, I'm going to leave and go off and do something else. And nobody was really surprised, but it was still sad to see him go. He was our friend. And after, after some time had gone by, I said to Swamiji, you know, maybe it's for the best that he left because there were lessons that he needed to learn in the world. And again, Swami responded very strongly. He said, how can you say that? He said, I cried all night when he told me he was going to leave because I knew the suffering that was going to come. And yet when the man told him he was going to leave, Swami didn't try to stop him. He had to choose of his own free will. And so, my friends, we have a tremendous responsibility, both to ourselves, to other people, but more importantly, to God and Guru. And that's to use our free will in the highest possible way, to use it not to assert, well, this is what I think, and maybe you don't think that way, but what's the good of all that? The only right choice to make is what's going to bring me closer in attunement with God. And everything else is just sort of, I don't know, stuff. So let's remember that God has profound respect for us. We are his children. And that's another thing that Swamiji unfailingly did. And I think I'm among the many things and gifts he gave us. It's one of the things I'm the most grateful for. When I came here many years ago to the path to Ananda, I didn't have confidence in myself as a spiritual seeker. I didn't identify very strongly in that way. But Swami saw in each of us, everyone, unfailingly, unconditionally, he saw the highest in us. And he, he related with respect and honor to that so that little by little you came to believe in yourself. And so as we go forward in the spiritual life, let's remember God has respect for our individual free will. He will not interfere. But we need to have respect for the divinity within us. and We need to honor it. And the choices we make with our own free will, let them be always in the direction of finding God within, without, and sharing God to the full extent that we are capable with everyone that we meet. God bless you.
Blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called the children of God. Bless those reviled for righteousness' sake, for 